That's why we allow you to have your way. You're holy, 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 holy. You're holy, you're holy, you're holy, you're holy. You're holy, you're holy, you're holy, you're holy. You're holy, you're holy, you're holy, you're holy. We bow before your throne. We bow before your throne. We bow before your throne. You're righteous, God. You're righteous, God. You're righteous. You're righteous, God. You're righteous, God. Hallelujah. Come on and give him a praise this morning. Come on, I hear a couple of claps saying We're talking about a God that delivers you out of the dark, amen. We're talking about a God that forgives you in spite every time. How many times you've done wrong? He still stepped in and said, I already allowed my son to go to the cross for that transgression, but I still love you in spite of. I still love you in spite of. And he deserves the glory this morning. He deserves the glory, he deserves the honor. He deserves the glory, he deserves the honor. He deserves the glory, he deserves the honor. Where the praise is at, where the worship is at this morning. Let your soul arise for the Prince of the Spirit. Oh, my God. 
talk. Stop being converted to those roles, to those cues. How many are willing to do that this morning? How many are willing? Well, as we begin to sing, you just allow the Holy Spirit. He deserves, he deserves. He 
is worthy to be praised. Yes, he is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be praised. He is worthy Glory, yes, he does. I know what he's done for me. What has he done for you? I know what the Lord has done for me in my life. When I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, Hallelujah. That's why we praise His name. That's why we have to sing songs of praise. That's why we have to sing songs of worship to Him. That's why we have to sing songs the angels can sing. Amen. Because he deserves the glory, he deserves the honor, yes he does. He deserves the glory, yes he does, yes he does. My God is a great God, he's a great God. Yes he does, yes he does. One more time, he deserves, he deserves. He deserves the glory, he deserves the honor. He deserves, he deserves, yes, he does. He deserves the glory, he deserves the honor. Now listen, listen. He brought you through this. And then he brought you through that. He even shed his light upon you. When you were in the midst of darkness, amen. When you were down in the valley, amen. And you couldn't hear nobody pray, amen. When you felt like you were all alone, you felt as if you were hopeless, amen. He still showed his love toward you. And that's why he deserved the glory this morning. While you're driving on the highway, he kept you, amen. While you were in the midst of your wall, amen, he kept you, amen. I think sometimes other people, we tend to forget about the little things. I might not be where I should be. But as long as I know where, that I'm where God wants me to be. Sometimes we strive so hard to be like others and what they are and what they produce. Amen. But you have to understand this morning that God is looking at you as you. Amen. He's not looking at you as the person beside you. But he's looking at what you can produce to crown him Lord. And to crown him as your savior, amen. So this morning, people of God, we, we gotta come out of the position of religiosity. And what I mean is, you hear people talk about all the wondrous things that he's done. And we think about it and, and nothing ever happens, meaning that we don't we don't do anything to gratify or to satisfy God because of what he's done. We've got to come into a position where we've got to learn to worship him because he's God. Because he delivered me out of a tight situation. Because it's even because when I was going down the wrong track, amen, he used many men and women of God to speak a word to bring me back to where I need to be in him. That's enough to praise him for this world. Sunday. And nothing ever changes when we leave because we don't allow what he's doing to become a reality to, to the destiny that he's pushing us to. We, we come to 
church because we know that our dad is the pastor. Our dad is our, 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 our uncle, our aunt, or whatever. You know, you know what I'm saying? People that are in the midst of us, that we, we tend to look at them as they are. But we miss the whole picture. They're getting theirs, amen, because they know who God is. But what God is requiring that we do is that we stop utilizing these labels to put us in a position where we think that we are owed something. And just begin to praise God for who he is. For allowing you to be in a house that speaks the truth. For allowing you to be in a position that you can call on his name. And he will lend his ear in your direction. I've done been in many different situations. I've been broke. I've been hurt up. I've been talked about. I've done been mistreated. I've done had sickness in my body. I've even, I've even had low self-esteem about who I am. I struggle with things. I go through things. But guess what? I can stand here this morning to say when I think about how he brought me out. That begins to stir up a praise on the inside of me that I can't stop. Even in the times when, when it's nothing but a word to somebody else about what God can do, He's still being glorified. But yet we come to church. And I'm not saying that you ought to think about all the things that you've done uh, uh, because actually it actually comes to, the, to a point of this. Knowing who you serve. Honoring who you serve. In spite of if, he, if, if God didn't do it, guess what? You still should have a praise in your spirit. If you still down in the valley and you can't hear nobody pray, you still need to have a praise. Why? Because God is God, amen. And if it wasn't for him allowing his son to shed his blood, you wouldn't be here this morning. All I can see in the spirit realm is the face of a lion. The lion of Judah. Where is that? The lion of Judah. As your praise, Judah means praise. As you begin to praise God, the lion of Judah begins to arise. And, 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 and guess what he actually does? God is everything that the enemy throws at you. Every demonic strategy, he begins to roar through your praise, amen, and shatters everything that the enemy has set up against you. That's why you need to open up your mouth this morning. That's why you need to give him a shout of praise, amen. position in your life where you just say, I'm going to praise you God, regardless of, of what's going on in society. I'm going to praise you regardless of the sickness that's ravaging my body. I'm going to praise you in spite of, then guess what? The Lion of Judah's roar will begin to cause everything that is not like God to be scattered from you. Somebody need to hear that this morning. All you have to do is praise him. You might think that your situation is a turn around. But something's happening because you're still here. You're still being worked on. People are still able to speak to you in a manner that they do. God is still working. God is still working. Vicky King, God is still working. God is still working on your behalf. Amen. So you continue to praise and worship him. Because if he did it before, he can do it again. Hallelujah. Come on and just say, if he did it before, he'll do it again. But my praise is required. 
My worship is required. Hallelujah. So come on, begin to honor him around now. Come on, look for the fear of mouth right now. Let's begin to honor him. You took away, you took away, you took away my sin, Lord. You took away my sins, so I can praise, so I can praise.
restoring you. Come on and lift your hands and receive restoration power. See, when God is doing surgery, when God is releasing something, you know what is not about the time, but it's about what God is getting ready to do in you. In your belly, in your belly. Your baby shall live again. Your baby shall live again. Your baby shall move again. Your baby shall move again. Your baby shall move. Your dream shall be 
begin again. Your dream shall begin again. Everything that was shattered, everything that was shattered, everything that was shattered, God is restoring you. God is restoring you. God is restoring you. Everything that was shattered, everything that was shattered, everything, everything that was shattered, everything that was not me. I'm 
I'm touched by your pain. I'm touched by you every time. Every time I look at you, I feel all the stripes on my back. Every time I look at you, every time I look at you, I see myself. I see what I did. I see what I did for you. That's how much I loved you. That's how much I care for you. That's how much I love you. How much I love you. I love you so much till they beat me. Till they beat me till all the flesh fell from my bones. They beat me and it was excruciating, agonizing. I did that just for you. Not just so you can just be, be you, but so you can be mine. So you can be my peculiar people. So you can be my peculiar treasure. You are a treasure. You're just like a box of perfume. When I open you up, I want to smell you. I want to smell the worship. I want to smell the praise. I want to smell. I want to smell. I know what I want. And I want the smell of my anointing.
Y'all better know about Club Lucy now. Come on, somebody know about Club Lucy. You may not call it Club Lucy, but I'm calling it Club Lucy. Amen. And you walk in the place and the DJ was spinning some music and they had a beat to it and got your soul to clicking and moving, amen. And pray, I can see other D's now. She said she was a dancer for real, amen, in the nightclub. And you just you just got wrapped up in what was happening in that atmosphere. Amen. Well, it's the same concept in the in, in the kingdom of God. We come into the house and amen. The, the spirit of God is flowing and the music is sounding good on the Elkell. It be sounding good, don't it? I watch some of y'all. I see some of the moves y'all used to do when y'all was in the world. They just come out in the kingdom. Amen. You just you just shaking and rolling and doing everything else. Amen. Praise God. It's because God gave you that ability to glorify Him. Amen. And we took it out of context and we use it in the world and in the lust and desires of our flesh. And, you know, we call it dancing and getting down or whatever. Amen. But it's all about him. Praise God. Come on, tell someone. Say, blessed is the place that the Lord has set apart for himself. So if you didn't know it, you are that place. Now, I want you to think about what I just said. Now, if you truly acknowledge that you are the place that's been set apart for the Lord. Well, the Bible tells us that where the presence of the Lord is, there's liberty. So you should never be bound. You understand what I'm saying? You should never be bound. Take your neighbor to neighbor. No matter what you experience, no matter what you go through, you're never bound. The enemy comes in, the Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will lift up a standard. Amen? Well, if there's nothing that you put in you, there's no standard that can be lifted up. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that we, we have that responsibility. I don't care how long you've been saved. Amen? I don't care how long you've been walking with the Lord. You cannot afford to stop doing what it takes to stay there. You got to learn to condition yourselves. Amen? Praise God. Would you go home today and and not cook anything to eat until next Sunday? Y'all be some beautiful looking folks in up in here if you did that. Amen. Praise God. Come on up for real now. How much more for our spirit man? Amen. I wish they hurry up and get the kids situated because I'm going to get distracted now. I need to. Okay. Amen. We need to settle down. <laughs> That's something, something the Lord wants to say today. Amen. It make me kind of nervous to say it. But I'm going to let him have his way. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I was with Deacon Joe yesterday. He said, oh God. He said, when you drop a bucket, Pastor, something's going to come up. Amen. Amen. I'm dropping the bucket today. And he tried to catch everything so it can come up and come up and come up out of you. Amen. Amen. So we can get on with kingdom business. Amen. Amen. Somebody say, the Lord, the Lord is dropping a bucket in me. Bucket and he's going to pull up gonna pull everything up. that ain't good for me. So we can get on with kingdom business. Amen. You believe that? Give them a hand clap. All right. I'm going to deal with a topic uh, today that, you know, I'm always listening to other ministries. And sometimes I hear a word, not the exact word that I heard, but something that's kind of goes on in my spirit. And when I come to Bible studies and I'm taking notes and writing down things that I'm hearing, and then... Even on yesterday, when we went to the uh, Bridge Builders breakfast, uh, Deacon Harris and myself were not. Um, Deacon Al showed up yesterday. He was working. But even yesterday, I was listening, I always listen, I always listen. For God to confirm something that I'm hearing. I know that uh, Pastor Deeds, uh, that I stood the last couple of Sundays, and she, she preached a powerful word. And uh, I'm sure she don't mind. Hey, man, I'm going to pick it back up what she was saying. Amen. Whether she mad or not, I'm going to do it. Amen. Praise God. And that, that's the reason the work was released. That God's trying to build upon something. Amen. It doesn't matter who he uses to lay the foundation. Amen. We're supposed to build upon that. Amen. He used Christ to lay the foundation, right? Amen. That's the only foundation we're supposed to be building upon. Amen. So I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use for a topic today, and this is this is a personal question. Look at your neighbor and say, this is a personal question. And I want you to ask yourself. 
Only, see, the thing is, is only you can answer this question. Because only you know. Amen? And my topical question today is where am I spiritually? Pastor Deeds was preaching here and teaching, and I truly enjoy uh, the word that, that uh, she released here in the past couple of weeks. And, uh, she was dealing with the, with, uh, with the heart. Amen? Dealing with the heart. Something I want to read to you about the heart before, before we begin teaching this. And I pray that, that you came to to receive something, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will impart something in you today. That's what it's all about. You receiving an impartation from Him. Not me. I'm not the imparter. I'm just the vessel. Amen? It's by His Spirit that things get done. It's by His Spirit that you're delivered. It's by His Spirit that you're set free. It's by the Spirit of God that everything that happens in your life happens. It's by the Spirit. You understand? I want to read a couple of things to you about the heart right, right quick. And I want you to understand, and, 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 and some of you guys may already know this, but that's, that's okay. Um, the Bible teaches us, and a lot of people think, and I'm sure you've heard this before, a lot of us think that our brain is our control center. But it's not your brain. Sure that your brain or the mind is the battleground. That's where spiritual war takes place in your mind. That's why the mind has to be renewed day by day. Amen? But the center or the totality of your intellect and the central control center for your body, your entire being, is your heart. Amen? Let me, let me, let me read a couple of things to you about the heart before we get into this. See, Proverbs 4.23 tells us to keep that heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. In other words, it says guard your heart. You have to protect it. Because from the heart flows the issues of life. Amen? Everything that you deal with in your life, it comes from the heart. The decisions that you make, they come from the heart. Not the brain. They come from the heart. So, the Bible teaches us that the heart is a knowledge faculty. Get this now. People know things in their heart. They pray in their hearts. They meditate in their hearts. They hide God's word in their hearts. They devise plans in their hearts. They keep words within their hearts. They think in their hearts. They doubt in their hearts. They ponder in their hearts. They believe in their hearts. They sing in their hearts. The heart is also the center of our feeling. Amen? Alright? The Bible speaks about uh, a glad heart, a loving heart, a fearful heart, a courageous heart, a repentant heart, an anxious heart, an angry heart, amen, a revived heart, an anguished heart, 
the delighted heart, the grieving heart, the humble heart, the excited or burning heart, the trouble heart, all these actions of the heart primarily involve an inner feeling. Listen to this. Finally, the heart is the center of all volition activity. What is volition activity? Pastor, what word are you talking about? I'm talking about volition activity is the place where free will is. Where you choose or you make choices. Your desire, your determination. Amen? Your, your, your discretion, your purpose, your will and your willingness. All these things, all these functions, all this activity comes from your heart. Amen? Now, Monday, February the 15th, which was last Monday, the day after Elder Dean's got finished teaching her two-week series on the heart, the word of the Lord came to me. And I say it came to me because every morning I turn on my iPad, there's a word that comes to me. And I look at it as a lot of people like, oh, that's just a Bible app. No, somebody's behind that orchestra and that word came to me. And amazingly enough, Elder Dees, the word that came to me came from Jeremiah 17, dealing with the heart. She came for two weeks and she laid a foundation about our hearts. Monday morning, I turn on the iPad and God is still speaking about the heart. Now, I, I want to go to Jeremiah chapter 17, and I want to look at something here. Nick, I didn't give you the scriptures. I'm sorry, son. Jeremiah chapter 17, and I want to look at verse number, number 9, and I pray that this internet will work today, because there is a, another version of Jeremiah 17 that I want to give you. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17. And we get it, say so I got it. This internet does not want to cooperate. Jeremiah 17, I'll just take the time. Ain't no Super Bowl on this Sunday. Praise God. I heard you. Somebody said LD should have been preaching. Jeremiah 17. And I want to look at something here in the King James. And this is what it says. Come on, internet. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know? God is telling us right here in the first verse of scripture that we can't even trust our own heart. Amen? Yeah, Jeremiah 17, verse 9. He's telling us that we can't even trust our own hearts. Because mistakenly enough, Elder Carolina, what we'll do is we won't pay attention to what our heart's really doing. Because what's in your heart and what's in your will, or what your desire is, amen, sometimes they don't line up. God is trying to do something in your heart, but your desire is stronger than to have your heart renewed, amen? Or your heart made right, or your heart cleaned up, all right? Let me... Let me stick with this. All right. Now, <laughs> he says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Listen to the Amplified Version. The heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful, a puzzle that no one can figure out but I, God. Search the heart and examine the mind. I get to the human, I get to the heart of the human, I get to the root of things, I treat them as they really are, not as they pretend to be. 
We can pretend to be one way, but God knows what's really happening with us. Oh, just keep being quiet and keep listening to me. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, 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 I'm like, Lord, what in the world? God says, I search the heart and examine the mind so that I can get to the root of things, not as they pretend to be silly enough. There are some of us here this morning that refuse to really deal with our hearts. You got a heart issue, you got a heart condition, you know it. And you allow the devil to fool you and make you think you're all right. You don't want to forgive because you don't ever forget. Every time you see someone, you're reminded of the same thing they trespassed and did against you. So you can't walk in the forgiveness of the Lord because, because the Bible says if we forgive not those that what trespass against us, neither will he forgive us. Our hearts are messed up. We got hidden agendas. We got hidden motives. Amen. There's a Bible, there's a scripture somewhere I think David said, Father, cleanse me of my secret sins. See, we, we, can, we can pretend to be a certain way when we're in the church. And we sit up here and we can communicate and we can participate in Bible study and we can say all the right things to make one another think we know something. Amen. Well. But then we walk out the door, we still hateful, we still spiteful, we still mean. Nothing's really changing because our hearts are still messed up. Now, now, now Ella Deans was preaching this uh, another Sunday, and and uh, um, 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 <laughs> uh, look at your neighbor. It's a neighbor. <laughs> so you know you got a heart condition, and you know you ain't all right. Look at someone. Is there someone uh, 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 that you know, and when you see them, you start feeling uncomfortable? Because your heart is not pure toward that person. There's still an unresolved issue. There's still some resentment. There's still some spite. There's still some anger. There's still something inside of you, something that you dealt with. It can go all the way back to when you were a child. Amen. And God is trying to get to the root of the problem, amen? But you are standing in yourself because you think you are right. I was violated. I have a right to be the way I am. God says, no, you don't. He says, I, the Lord, search the heart. And he says, I'm only going to give you according to the fruit of your doings. If you think you are right, then what I give you will be in order with what you think is all right. Not what I want to give you because you won't allow me to deal with your heart. I don't want to be. I don't want to be. I don't want to be a, a, a Christian that can't release and forgive people. I sat in the midst of some folk yesterday that talked cash trash about PC. Hey, PC is past the chain, right now. But it's okay. See, I didn't tell you that, did I? When all this stuff was going on about six years ago, some of the very ones that was in the room with me yesterday and I was sitting down breaking bread with had something to say. And I just sat there with a smile. And then he gave me an opportunity to say something. And I had to be honest about what I felt. And this is what I told him. I said, I have, there's been times that I felt like 
that no one in this city wanted to deal with me. I said, but through the process, God developed and took me to a place of knowing who I am. And when you know who you are, the devil can't come in and mess with your mind. Amen. He may mess with you for a moment, amen, but he cannot come and control your mind because God has reassured you of who you are. And I have the responsibility of demonstrating his character. If Jesus walked with a thief the 12 years of his ministry, I can hang around people that don't like me. King David, amen. God had to send a prophet to King David. Amen. The prophet came to King David. This is why he came to King David. To expose and to show David what was really in his heart. <laughs> Listen. David's position as king had blinded his ability to acknowledge the sin that was active in his life. Because I'm king. I can do what I want to. Because I'm deacon. I can do what I want to do. Because I'm elder, I can do what I want to do. Because I'm the minister, I can do what I want to do. Because I'm the prophet or the prophetess or the apostle, I can do what I want to do. God says, no. Sin opens the door for the devil to steal, kill, and destroy you. What do you mean? That was King David. He called for her and she came because he was the king. That didn't make it right. A door had got open. Amen? St. John 10, 10 says, but the thief come to what? Kill Steal and what? Destroy. Destroy. So my question to you was that some of us are sitting here this morning. We got some open doors. And we know that the devil is sitting at the gate of our door. And we won't do nothing about it. But we think we're all right. I ain't preaching to nobody in here, man. My question to you is, where are you spiritually? Where am I spiritually? What doors are open in your life that you're refusing to shut? Everybody has a conscience, amen? Everybody knows when they're right, and they know when they're wrong. David knew he was wrong. But he tried to Cover it up. Why? Because he was king. Oh, we're going to get into this in a little bit here. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, get this. Listen to me. Listen to me. I got so much stuff. I had to write this stuff down. Amen. See, the thing that we don't understand about sin is that sin invites consequences into our lives. Oh, what consequences and what unwarranted circumstances are prevalent in your life? But you sitting over there, you so busy looking over in my life trying to figure out. You're trying to look at somebody this morning. This, I, I want you to get some eye contact with somebody. Don't you look at somebody. Don't, don't, don't look at me. Look at somebody else. Amen. Look at somebody. And you're looking over in that person's life and you're trying to figure out. Why does he do what he do? Why does she do what she do? And God is asking you, why are you doing what you're doing? Are 
understand what I'm saying? Sin is not our friend. Amen? What consequences and unwarranted circumstances are prevalent in your life? Because you have demonstrated an inability to allow sin to dominate in your life. Let's look at what, what sin does. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy 4. Let's look at what sin does. First Timothy chapter 4. And let's, let's, let's deal with this just for a few minutes here. Look at here. First Timothy 4 verse 1. A couple things that sin does. Now the spirit, hear this now, verse 1. Now the spirit, you got to say I got it. Now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times. Somebody say he's talking about right now. These are latter, latter times. These are final days. These are last days. Amen. Can we all agree on that? Amen. Okay. Now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times. Some shall depart from the faith. So in order for a person to depart from the faith, first of all, he must have been a believer. Something horrific, something went on, something happened in his life to cause him to stop trusting God. Amen? Can we agree about that? Amen. Praise God? All right? So, Sin will cause us to do what? Depart from the faith. He says, giving heed to what? Seducing spirits. When we stop trusting God because of sin in our lives, then we can be seduced by the enemy. Oh. She looked good to me. Now she was sent from the pits of hell. Amen. Hello, somebody. Oh, he's so fine. Now, he was sent by the enemy to distract you. Get this. Let's, get, let's focus on the second part of this. And the doctrine of devils, verse number two is where I'm going to go. Speaking lies in the prophecy. He's talking about false teachers and all that. But, get this. Look what happened to them. Having their conscience seared with a what? Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Listen, sin called David to deviate from the faith. He allowed flesh to lead him out, out there, and he was going to allow flesh, his position as king, to bring him out by curbing up his sin. Listen. Having your conscience seared with the hot iron means this. You lose the capacity to operate in the truth. What do you mean, lose the capacity? Sin will come in and cause you to start accepting things that you know you ain't got no business accepting. Conscience, seal. What is conscience? An alert system. What does conscience do? It weighs the rightness or the wrongness of an action. Well, if that gets seared, then you lose your capacity to operate in the truth. You ever took a hot iron? You've been ironing your pair of jeans or something, you know, iron, you know, put some crease in to make it sharp, look good, right? You mess around, you had the iron too hot, and you burn. And you got an imprint of the iron on your pants. On your leg. Ain't nobody gonna know it's just a new style. Amen. Now they know you burnt your pants. Amen. Come on, somebody. Well, sin comes in our lives. Amen. And sin causes us to lose the capacity to deal with the truth. You understand what I'm saying? It sears our conscience. And our conscience is our alert system. Our conscience is the thing, once again, that allows us to weigh what? The rightness. Or the wrongness of a situation. In other words.
words, when our conscience gets seared, then we start compromising. Oh, my God. Some of y'all looking at me like, oh, I sure could jump on him right now. Am I making any sense? David allowed his conscience to become seared. And he began to move in his flesh. His appetite was his desire. Amen. What he saw is what he wanted. He saw Bathsheba bathed by the pool. His flesh rose. He said, I got the hell of Amen. I'm the king, so bring her on. And it felt good. Hebrews 11, 25 tells us sin is good. Don't believe it? Turn around and read it. Dealing with Moses. Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh to enjoy the pleasures of what? Sin for a season. It's only seasonal. Why is it seasonal, Pastor? Because it will reap a set of consequences. And it will give birth to a place of pain that you'll be glad to get back to Jesus. Oh, y'all ain't going to shake your head this morning. I know I'm preaching real good today, amen. Y'all see what I'm saying? It gave birth to some consequences for David. Not only was David affected, but his whole lineage, his whole family was affected by what he did. Am I making any sense? Take that to don't lose your capacity. Say, when you hear the truth, and sometimes the truth don't feel good, you better let the truth make you feel good. Open up your eyes. And do what you need to do. Amen? Well, 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 Pastor, then we go here. And I'm so glad that last week I got a chance to watch the preachers and laugh. Elder Morris asked me, said, you ever seen the preachers of Atlanta? I said, no, I ain't never seen. I seen the ones in L.A. And you need to watch the ones in Atlanta. And I began to watch the ones in Atlanta. And people have taken the grace of God and they have caused it, made it, or tried to make it suit a lifestyle that they want to live. Listen to me. Well, Pastor, I thought that God's grace uh, 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 says, according to uh, Isaiah uh, 43, 25, I thought that the grace of God came that he forgave us of of, 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 of past, present, and future sin. That's true. But God's grace was never intended for you to justify a lifestyle. It was never intended for you to say something like, well, God, he understands how I got in this situation. And I know, no. God, he understands I'm under grace. We had a, had a pastor to even, even say, she, she dressed up like something. Like, I'm not, I'm just... I'm not calling her name. I'm just going to say what I saw. She dressed up like a hooker in the street at night. And that's her way of ministering and pulling people in. That's fine. And she passing out cigarettes and condoms. But the other thing is that on the other side at night when she got home, she began to talk like this. I turn up when I want to. Amen. This is my blank house. I drink when I want to. She cussed. She do all this other stuff. This is the, this is the ministry that God gave me. Now, where is God in that? You can turn up when you want to. You can cuss when you want to. You can dress and look like a floozy when you want to. Hello, somebody. I understand passing out condoms and safe sex. But you promote it's okay to have sex. How would you feel... This morning, if I had to stand here and ask the church to forgive me because I hit the shooter last night. I 
I'm probably looking all crazy by this time. But the Lord said, I'm under grace, so you know, he understand my struggle. <laughs> looking like a hula. Come on, somebody. Every now and again, I'll, I'll say something to you about the grace of God, then I'll do this. Anybody, anybody coming? Y'all see somebody coming? Y'all see that one? Oh, that's the spirit. Amen. You see that spirit? Would you sit here? This is my blank house. This is my. Where's the standard of the Lord? I'd much rather hear him say, I fell into one of my, my, my weaknesses and I started drinking again and I asked the Lord to forgive me. And I'm trying to do better. Then to say it's okay. Look at your neighbor, say none of us perfect. So you got your struggles. I got my struggles. We all got our struggles. But God's grace has been set there for us to come out of our struggles. See, see, sin caused David to deviate from the faith. Caused him to deviate. I mean, he deviated. He deviated. Amen. He deviated. Take care of his name. That's true. But let's not get God's grace with operating in our own will. See, see this dispensation, here it is. This dispensation of God's grace has been given for us to walk in total abandonment. Somebody say total abandonment. Total abandonment and control from our flesh. Abandon means this is a verb. It means to leave behind, to relinquish, to back out, to cut loose, to discard. To discontinue, to kiss bye-bye, to surrender. Grace gives us the ability to surrender our carnal nature to God and get a fresh new start. Listen to the word. Judge your own life. I'm getting ready to say something to you. I want you to take this scripture and I want you to judge your own life. How many of y'all say it? So the ones that raise their hand, they ain't saved. Y'all need to get saved. How many y'all saved? Oh, I see your hand went up that time. <laughs> Listen, I want you to hear this scripture. And I want you to really take it and evaluate the fruit of your life. You're in Christ. Right? Everybody in Christ. Right? We said this so many times and it sounds so good. Sister Ruby, I'm telling you, it sounds so good. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says what? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, what's the best of Is a new creature, all things have Pass away, behold, all things, uh, all things have become new. All right? Think about this. Close your eyes. In your mind, get your list together. And I want you to think about the old things that you're still doing. And think about the new things that you ought to be doing. Which side outweighs the other? Don't tell nobody. Now lift your head and open your eyes. If you're still doing old stuff, you ain't in Christ. Not the way you should be. Because 
sometimes we get caught up in struggles. Sometimes things happen. Sometimes God revealed things to us that we didn't think we were still capable of doing. But you're not supposed to accept things because you did something wrong. You're supposed to not become satisfied until you get away from everything that you know that you're doing that ain't right. That's for me, and that's for you. Am I making any sense? I asked the Pastor Allen a question yesterday morning. I said, Pastor, I said, how do you handle when God shows you stuff about yourself that you know that you shouldn't be doing? He went a step further. He said, five weeks ago, God showed me something I thought I had dealt with. He said it was it was horrific and it was terrible and it was ugly. He said, but I thank God that he showed me. That's grace. Grace has been given to show you what you need to deal with. And grace has been given to give you the ability to get it done. Not to say, well, it's okay, I'm under grace. God understand. Brother Morris made a, made a statement this morning. I'm glad he changed it. You need to think about this. He said, thank God I'm not what I used to be. Did I say that? I think I'm not what I used to be. I never knew even still this in my mind. Now hold on a second. And we all say this sometimes. Say it again. Thank God I'm not what? I'm not what I I'm not what I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. Something like that. You can think about that. Thank God I'm not what I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. Why don't you think about that? Thank God, I'm not where I ought to be. Okay? Thank God that I'm not what I'm not where I ought to be. I, I, I want to say it like that for a minute. Thank God, I'm not where I ought to be. Or thank God, I'm not where I used to be. Maybe that makes sense. Thank God I'm not what? Well, I used to be, but thank God I'm not what? I can't get it to make sense. Thank God I'm not what I ought to be, but I, I thank God I'm not where I used to be. Thank God I'm not where I ought to be. But thank God I'm not what I used to be. Huh? Thank God I'm not who I need to be.
says. What's in the Shane? Goes in the church like this. Can anybody help me with that? I think I got it all messed up. He said, "Let me go." <laughs> Praise God. Do you understand my point? What's <laughs> everybody say in all the churches that you go to? You see somebody stand up and say, "Thank God, I'm not what I used to be, but thank God, I ain't where I ought to be," or something like that. Yeah, well, anyway, pray God. It goes, it goes something like that. But either way it goes, either way it goes, the point is this. We know there's something wrong in our lives. Amen? Can we just settle with it right there? Not what we used to be, and we're not what we ought to be, so we know something wrong, right? Okay, all right. Pray God. Don't think that wrong. All right. Come on, give God a hand. All right. But listen, grace gives us the ability to surrender the carnal nature to God and to get a fresh new start. Now, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says what? Therefore, if any man be what? All things have what? Behold, all things have become new. Amen. Sometimes it takes, in the process, it takes a little longer for some of the old to pass away. But the thing of it is this, don't get caught up in the process. And it's 15, 20 years down the road, and you're still doing the whole stuff. You have not received the grace of God. Every day that you wake up to another day of his glory, God is giving you an opportunity to examine the fruit of your life, to see and know that, you know what, God, you gave me another day to correct the wrongness in my life. Let me take advantage of that, and that's what I'm working on, and I'm not going to be satisfied until I get it all worked out. Amen? You understand what I'm saying? You can't get stuck in the midst. Amen? Now, now, ask your neighbor some neighbor. Ask yourself, where am I spiritually? Now, I want you to look at something. Let's go to uh, Ephesians chapter 4. I'll be doing a few minutes. It's about 125. I'll be doing a few minutes. I'm trying to get it down like Pastor D. Did. She don't preach long. Ephesians chapter 4. Come on, somebody say I got a heart issue. Ephesians 4.17. So we understand now that sin causes us to have our conscience sheared with a hot iron. And we understand that that means that we lose the capacity to operate in what? We operate in what? In the truth. Why did nobody one person know that? Y'all didn't hear me. <laughs> Having your conscience shared with the hard hand means that we lose the capacity to operate in what? Truth. Truth. All right. You got Ephesians? Ephesians 17. Ephesians 4 and 17 says this. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other who? Gentiles walk in the what? Vanity of their mind. Not knowing who you are or what you've been called to. Amen. He says, but having what? The understand, having their understanding dark and being alienated from what? The life of God through what? The ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Jeremiah told us that the heart is what? Desperately wicked. Who can know it? It'll cause us to walk in blindness. Trying to figure out which way am I going? What am I doing? Why do I keep doing this? When David realized that, he cried out to the Lord. He said, Father, create in me a clean heart and what? Renew the right spirit.
19 says, Who being past feelings have given themselves over to the seriousness and the work of all the things of grievance? He says, verse 20, But ye have not so learned of Christ. Christ. <coughs> when we operate and function and flow with a blind heart, we haven't learned Christ. He's not. Psalms, the book of Psalm 119, that place says, Our word is a what? Lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. The word, the word, the word. That word is a what? Lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Wow. <laughs> verse 23 says, No, verse 21 says, And if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in who? Jesus, he says that he what? Put off concerning the former, that word conversation means what? Lifestyle. The old what? Man, which is what? Corrupt according to what? Deceitful us. 23 says that be what? Renewed in the spirit of your mind that ye put on the new man, which after God is what? Created in what? Righteousness and true holding this. Then he says, Work for pull away what? Lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are what? Members one of another, and be ye what? Angry and sin not. That was a word this morning that came up on an iPad. Told me not to be angry, but I was pretty upset about some stuff that happened, that happened a few days ago. He said, Be not angry and what? Sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. 27 says, But neither give what? Place to the devil. When we stay angry, when we don't release and let stuff go, we give place to the devil. Thank God for his peace that came over me yesterday afternoon. Peace had to come. Because I was troubled in my mind and my spirit about something that happened here in the church. Now, and number 28 says this Let him that what? Stole, steal no more. But rather let him what? Labor, working with his hands, a thing which is good that he may have to what? Give to him that needed. There is a thief in this house. That I'm pretty mad about. I ain't going to front. I ain't going to tell you. I just took it in a smile. No. Because I like to know that I'm in the vineyard laboring with people that I can trust. I don't have any doubts about the people that I place in their prospective places in the leadership capacity that you operate in. Let me clear it up first. I don't want nobody getting offended and me just saying, Pastor trying to use a pulpit to tell me what he can't tell me. No, I'm careful telling you what I didn't tell you. I don't talk to my finance committee, amen. I don't talk to some of the urses. Now I'm talking to the whole congregation. A thief will not benefit and prosper in the kingdom of God. You will be revealed. Jesus knew who was with him. He knew it was in his circle. But he allowed Judas to have his desire. And what happened to him? In the end, it was revealed. He hung himself. Because he realized he crucified the king of glory. I don't want to come to a place. Talk here for a minute. I'm going to get this out of my heart. We shouldn't have to come to a place where we got to put locks on everything. We had to lock the kitchen to keep people from stealing meat out of the freezer, stealing dishwasher liquid, tissue out the room. It's crazy. This is the house of the Lord. Look at your neighbor, your neighbor. Don't you get offended. Pastor ain't calling you a thief. He said, if you are a thief, God knows. And I pray for the person that is doing unjust, wicked stuff like that will be delivered. I 
pray that you will come to repentance. Because you got to deal with God. If you're in this room, amen. If you're not in this room, don't worry about it. But he said, let him that stole steal no more. We're going to have to put cameras up in the church. Now, if you steal from the church, you ain't got no problem stealing from me. But I understand these are a lot of times. And the Bible says in the book of Matthew, in a lot of days there will be a spirit of lawlessness. People have no morals, no judgment, no love. Some folk just come to churches, just peep out the churches. I don't know how I can get ahead of night. several times and he would be caught up in worship and my papa would be sitting on the thing and I'm like, oh, this, all I got to do is just wait till he caught up in worship and just slide my hand and quick grab something. Hope the Holy Ghost cut your hand off right? the manifestation of the physical world. I'm telling you because it don't make no sense. For you to be taught the, the principles of God's kingdom huh? and allow yourself to be a vessel for the enemy to use to do something. They don't want to try to pin it on somebody. Put it on your brothers now. Put it on the men. Because they took the envelopes and throw them in the trash can in the men's bathroom. Oh, wow. Hello, somebody. God is trying to teach the house how to get blessed and the devil gets busy. Hello? But guess what? Anybody they gave, you gave unto the Lord, and you'll still be rewarded for what you get for what you gave the Lord. You understand what I'm saying? It's not going to stop God's word operating in your life. So I decree and declare right now that you will not stop giving because there's a thief amongst you. He's going to get caught, or she going to get caught, amen, amen. and they're going to get delivered. Amen. Have to expose it. Get it out there. Somebody need to come to repentance. Grace gives us the ability to surrender our carnal nature to God and get a fresh new start. In Matthew, grace came to fulfill the law. Let's get Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. And Jesus said this. We're winding down. Take your neighbor and say, be patient. He's almost finished. Seventeen, five to 17. Listen to what Jesus said. You got to say, I got it. Jesus said this in 5 and 17. He says, think not that I've come to destroy the what? Or the I have come not to destroy, but to what? Fulfill. He says, for verily I said to you, till heaven and earth uh, pass, one jot nor one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be what? Fulfilled. In Romans chapter 5, let's go there. I don't want to quote it to you. I want you to read it for yourself. Romans chapter 5, what does it say? Romans 5. Where sin did what? About grace. Romans 5 and 20. Let's go there. 5 and 20. Romans 5 and 20. We got to say I got it. See some pages turning. Everybody still got it? Romans 5 and 20. I want to give you this, this, this version here. Romans 5 and verse 20. Get it, I got it. All right, got it? It says, moreover, King James says, moreover, the law what? Entered that the offense might abound. Now, that's powerful. But were sin what? Grace did much more what? Abound. Wow. When you look at the word abound, look at the word abound, let me give you a definition. 
Abound means to exist in abundance, to be alive with, to be all over the place, to be knee deep in. All right, you got that. The word about. Okay? The law, get this, the law came to show us how sinful we really are. That's the purpose of the law. Amen? All right? Our sins existed in abundance all over the place, and we would need the opinion. Amen? Even now, hear this, even now, we have some knee-deep situations that we are entangled in, and we don't know how in the world we are going to come out. Amen? But the law, get this, but the law exposes and allows us to see where we really are and what's really in our hearts. Now, I want you to focus on the second half of this. God said this. God says that where your sin abounded, where sin is knee deep and all over the place, he says, my grace did much more abound. Now look at the Amplified Version. I want you to see this. He said, but the law came in only to expand and to increase the trespass. Get this now. Making it more apparent and an exciting opposition. Wow. The law comes in or came in to show you how sinful you really are. Amen? Amen. But he says, but where sin increased and abounded, God's grace, God's unmerited favor has surpassed it and increased the more and super abounded. God says, I've given you, get this, he says, I've given you a free ticket to eternal life and all you have to do is forget about what you have done and embrace and receive what I'm giving you. Look at your neighbor and say, it's a neighbor. Forget about what you've done. That's right. Forget about it because what can you do about what you've already done other than do something What's he going to do about it? You cut somebody out yesterday. What's he going to do about it? You stole something. What's he going to do about it? You told a lie. What's he going to do about it? You left it in your heart after somebody's wife or husband. What's he going to do about it? You committed adultery. What's he going to do about it? You committed fornication. What's he going to do about it? The best thing that you can do about it is forget about it and make up in your mind that you ain't going to do it again. Oh, boy. Oh, somebody, 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 somebody. Woo, Jesus, hallelujah. Look here. Say, forget about it. Forget about it. Just receive forget his grace, grace and, move and move on. Get this. Grace came to us that sin would not dominate our lives I didn't say that we ain't going to sin because we all going to do something wrong, amen? But grace says you don't have to allow sin to dominate. Amen. Give me Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Are y'all hearing this? Yeah. Romans 6 and 11. Don't allow your mishaps to take you to a place of being dominated by what you did wrong. Can you receive that? Yeah. Come on, tell somebody it's a neighbor. Yeah. You will no longer will no allow, allow your mistakes, your, your faults, your, your mishaps to dominate who you are in Christ. Are in Christ. Listen, 
Verse 11 and Amplify says, Even so, consider yourselves also dead to sin and your relation to it broken, but alive to God, living in unbroken fellowship with him in Christ Jesus. He says, Let not sin therefore rule as king in your mortal, short-lived, perishable bodies. To make you yield to his cravings and to be subject to his lust and even passions. He says, do not continue offering or yielding your bodily members and balconies to sin as instruments, tools of wickedness. But offer and yield yourselves to God as though you have been raised from the dead to perpetual life. And your bodily members and balconies to God, presenting them as implements of righteousness. Number 14, you need to highlight, underline, put put semicolons around it or whatever you need to do, stars on the side. He says, for sin shall not any longer exert dominion over you. Since now you are not under the law as slaves, but under what? Grace as subjects of God's favor and mercy. Where am I spiritually? Something to think about. Am I allowing sin to dominate my life? Sin goes far beyond sleeping with somebody. What about the attitude? What about the character? What about your behavior? What about your conversation? Think about it. Grace was given. Grace is the power of God's love toward us. So that when we do mess up, we know that God still loves us. Why? Because he allows you to wake up again. Because he gave you another day of his glory. He extended his mercy toward you. And he did that so that you would not become subject to sin as your king. Am I making any sense? I guess I'm the only one in here as a Christian that's ever been in sin. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We ain't fooling God. Listen. In Revelation chapter 3, you ain't got to go there. Give me a keyboard player. You ain't got to go there. But in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, you can go read it for yourself. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, when God dealt with the seven churches, there's one thing that he said to all of them. When he, when, he, when he began to deal with the minister Rhodes, there's one thing he said to all of them. He said, I know thy works. What do you mean, Pastor? You became the church. In the Revelations, he told every one of them, he said, I know thy works. What do you mean? God says, I know what you think. I know what you do. I know how you live. I know everything there is to know about you. I know your struggles. I know your strengths. I know your weaknesses. God says, I know everything there is to know about you. Because he says, I know that works. Get this. God knows everything there is to know about you. Every thought you have. Your every desire, your motives, your agenda, your activities. Somebody say, God knows it all. But God says this, even though he knows everything, he says, in spite of everything you have done, just freely receive my grace and the power of my love, and it's his grace that causes us to surrender, 
So we won't be dominated by sin. That's the purpose of His grace. What does sin bring? Sin brings pain. Sin brings condemnation. And Jesus said, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ that walk after the spirit and not the flesh. In the, in, the, in the book of 1 John, it tells us, 1 John 1 and 8, says if we say we have not sinned, we lie. Well, that's all right. He said, but if we confess our sins, then he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And verse 10 says that we have not sinned. Thank you, Lord. That we make all of our lives truth is not us. So what do we all have in common, Brother Clark? We all know how to sin. So what does that mean? That means I can't judge you. <laughs> and you can't judge me. But then he turned around and said, but if any man judge, let him judge with the righteous judgment. Consider thyself. And maybe I look at yourself. I added that to him, amen. Praise God. <laughs> amen. You gotta consider you. We all got that in common. Yeah. Just take a look around the room. Stand on your feet. I'm getting rid of this guy. Hallelujah. Stand on your feet. Stand on your feet. I want you to do a 360. And I want you to look all the way around the room. Go ahead, everybody. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Look all the way around the room. That way you can see everybody around you. Amen. 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 And guess what? You just looked at someone that's just like you. And we all have the potency or the ability to still do wrong. Every one of us. So I can't judge you, and you can't judge me. Amen? What does righteous judgment? Encourage. Encourage. Galatians are uh, uh, Galatians uh, six and one. Uh, is it six and one? It says that every one among you that is found in the fault, ye that are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of what? Meek is considering thyself to be tender. God says, I, 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 I gave you room. And this kingdom I got called grace. And there's a free pass. You know how you go to the circus or you go to the carnival or you go to Kerwin somewhere and somebody give you a free ticket? That means that you can go in and enjoy everything except that site, right? Right? Amen? Well, God's grace is that free ticket. That even when we come short, even when we fall down, even when we mess up, his love continues. But it, it doesn't continue for us to continue to do the same thing. It continues for us to put to death the things that we're doing. That's why God says every man will stand before me without excuse. Why? Because of our grace. We can't say, God, you didn't give me a chance. Yes, it did. Because I'm 
I said Jesus I said grace Jesus said I didn't come to destroy the law of the prophets I came for the fulfillment so what if Jesus was a fulfillment of the law when he connected it with grace don't take it out of perspective receive God's grace in you the Bible says all of sin and come what? Short of the glory of God. If you know today that you're not where you ought to be, come to the altar for prayer. And we can change some things. Amen. I'm already standing here. Hallelujah. The word of the Lord comes to the preacher first.